Hey everyone, I'm Andrew Socek with WhatCulture.com and today we are talking about the most surreal moments in WWE history. You know those moments so crazy and weird you don't believe they actually happened? Well to help me out today is former WWE superstar Nick Eugene Dinsmore. Andrew? Yeah. Not Adam. No, uh... Where's Adam? He's, uh... I love Adam. He's the best. You're not Adam. No, he's in England. He's... So he's not here? No, no. He's not here. But that's okay, because we're in beautiful Sioux Falls, South Dakota. <coughs> that only works if you're over, kid. And the fact of the matter is, you gotta say it this way. We're right here in the best little city in America, Sioux Falls. I guess that was better. <laughs> you know what? I really need a bagel. Think you find me a bagel? I'm... I need one, man. Yeah, I... Let me finish the intro. I'll, I'll do it right. You want me right now? Please, please. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. You're the best. Yeah, I'll go. You're the best. From shocking evil twins to my own Uncle Eric delivering the hug heard around the world, these are the most surreal moments in WWE history. Hurry up with my bagel! Well, while I'm out grabbing some donuts for Nick, let's begin. Let's start with the man who infamously screwed Brett. But first, he screwed Hulk Hogan, but not in a weird way. Let's talk about twin refs. On February 5th, 1988, Ronald Reagan was president, Moonstruck came in at third at the box office, and 33 million viewers tuned in to watch the WrestleMania 3 main event rematch between Hulk Hogan and Andre the Giant on free TV. It remains the most watched wrestling match in the history of American wrestling. Besides a huge showdown, what fans got that night was something they'd never forget. Hulk Hogan losing the WWF Championship, ending his four-year title reign. No, brother. Dude. There's no way that was possible. It was a bizarre moment as the hero lost and he clearly had his shoulder up at the two count. Was the ref blind? Nope. Because he was in on the fix. Fans were familiar with referee Dave Hebner, but to that point they hadn't seen his brother Earl. As Ted DiBiase and Andre were celebrating their immortal victory, a man who looked identical to Dave entered the ring. Wait, that was Dave. So who was the ref then? That was Earl. The announcers were clueless, Hogan was confused and pulling out his last remaining hairs, and the fans didn't know how to process the situation. Backstage, Hogan was nearly in tears. Oh brother, feeling the tears of a thousand Hulkamaniacs. I guess that was more like a Randy Savage impression, but anyways, he came to the conclusion that it must have been plastic surgery. Or, you know, brother still would have been a more likely scenario, but that's okay. Well, not until Full House came on the air did a pair of cute twins capture the world's imagination quite like the Hebners. Next up, Austin joins Vince. In the late 90s, the biggest feud in all of wrestling was the evil billionaire Vince McMahon versus that lovable, huggable, beer-drinking redneck Stone Cold Steve Austin. For years, they made each other's lives a living hell. Vince tried to get Austin to conform, and Austin would then destroy his car. Vince fired Austin, and Austin responded with threatening to shoot his boss on national TV, which made him pee his pants. You know, the regular kind of office hijinks you find everywhere. Well, at WrestleMania 17, Austin made a deal with the devil himself when his boss helped him win the World Wrestling Federation Championship against The Rock. What? What? No, seriously, what? How, how did that happen? There had to have been a good explanation. Well, not really, because Austin just kind of turned into a psychopath and loved to start singing and giving hugs, kind of like a prototype to Bailey. This moment may have been surreal, but it was a massive mistake. Fans were not willing to boo the rattlesnake, and instead of tuning in for the next chapter, they just stopped watching. And now... The Pipe Bomb Promo Wrestling was in a sad state of affairs in the summer of 2011. John Cena as the unstoppable champ was tiring, and the most recent pay-per-view saw him defeat R-Truth in the main event. What's up indeed? Things are about to get a lot worse as we learn that CM Punk was going to leave WWE. Before he left though, he wanted to let us know how we all felt. That's pretty nice of him. Actually, it was pretty awesome. The man just no longer gave a damn. He sat at the top of the entryway and perfectly summed up the frustrations that many hardcore fans have had over the years. He told us that the only thing that John Cena was better at than him was kissing Vince McMahon's backside, which isn't any of our business, but he actually used that disgusting filthy word wrestler and not sports entertainer. He took a shot at The Rock for being in the main event of WrestleMania. He actually brought up Ring of Honor and blasted the leadership skills of Vince McMahon and his idiotic daughter and doofus son-in-law. His words, not mine. The promo blurred the lines of storyline and reality and got the WWE some great mainstream publicity. It created a huge buzz and made Punk an instant star. To this day, fans still debate which parts of the promo were actually planned. Let's talk about Eric Bischoff hugging Vince McMahon. 
A lot of people call Vince McMahon a genius, like a modern day Lanny Poffel, but he has a weird fetish of flushing money down the toilet. Case in point was the shocking, surreal appearance of Eric Bischoff on WWE television on July 15, 2002. McMahon officially killed the NWO that night, which seeing them in WWE in itself was surreal, and then he introduced a new general manager of Raw. The safe bets would have been someone like Mick Foley or a McMahon or maybe somebody who needed a job like Brutus the Barber Beefcake, but Eric Bischoff getting hired seemed about as likely as Byron Saxon winning an award for announcing. Yet there he was with his dyed black hair again and his trademark scumbag grin. This was incredible. This was going to be amazing. This was... Oh, they're just going to hug? Okay then. Well, you can only begin to guess how much money they lost out of swerving us, but seeing the Bish in WWE just one year after WCW went out of business is a moment the likes we will never see again. Uh-oh. Pillman's got a gun. When you've been hurt on the job, it's nice to have a little time at home so you can heal up and maybe catch up on some TV. Hey, maybe you can finally watch that fourth season of Growing Pains you've somehow missed. Well, in 1996, Brian Pillman thought he'd have some time to himself when he broke his ankle. However, Steve Austin was not going to let this happen. The two were engaged in an incredibly personal feud, and apparently it could not wait for the wrestling ring, so Austin threatened to head to Pillman's house during Raw to settle things. Possibly over a game of chess or WCW Revenge on the Nintendo 64. However, Pillman had another idea and showed us that he was packing heat, and said he was going to quote, blow his former friend's sorry ass straight to hell. Jeez, that just seems to be taking things a little bit too far. Austin ended up beating up a bunch of Pillman's friends and broke in the door as Melanie Pillman screamed in terror. Brian then pulled out a gun, had a crazy look on his face, and then... Commercial break? Are you serious? It, it, is Steve Austin dead? Well, two minutes later, we found out that Austin ran away. The whole thing felt more real and out of place than perhaps anything we'd ever seen in wrestling. Just think, a year earlier we'd seen Doink the Clown, Quang the Ninja, and Bushwhacker Luke on the roster. And now, we are watching attempted murder. Kids, I don't know if you should be watching this wrestling thing anymore. Maybe go watch something a little more wholesome like Oz. Here is the man they call Sting in WWE. When WCW and ECW went out of business, one star after the next came into WWE. Some of them took longer, but they all eventually joined. Scott Steiner, Goldberg, Hulk Hogan, Sandman, Sabu, and of course, the biggest name of them all, Boz Mahoney. But there was one lone holdout, a man who stayed out of Vince McMahon's grasp for decades. That man was Sting. After WCW folded, fans wanted dream matches between him and Steve Austin, The Rock, and The Undertaker. But instead, he went to TNA to fight Jeff Jarrett and Abyss. And then he had a midlife crisis and turned into the Joker. But finally, on November 23rd of 2014, he showed up at Survivor Series. We'd heard he'd signed with the company, but the sight of him, finally, in his mid-50s, inside of a WWE ring is one of the most surreal moments of the past few years. Watching him actually win one of his singles matches would have been even more surreal, but apparently that was too much to ask for. So what could be bigger than seeing Sting? That would be seeing the big gold belt in WWF. Many WCW fans are a bit confused on why Ric Flair didn't show up at the Great American Bash 1991. He was scheduled to defend his world heavyweight title against Lex Luger. But for those in the know, they couldn't stop chanting his name during the main event, when it was Luger versus Barry Windham. You see, just weeks before, Flair was asked to take a massive pay cut and begin a quick transition to the mid-card. He was also asked to cut his hair, get his ears pierced, and be known as Spartacus. And that, it's not a joke. He rightly refused and started negotiating with the WWF. Vince McMahon, seeing this as a golden opportunity, gladly hired him. This was huge. Flair, 10 years earlier, had won his first heavyweight title with the NWA and had become synonymous with the brand. Within two months, he showed up on Primetime Wrestling, a WWF show with WCW's World Heavyweight title absolutely surreal. This was the days before internet wrestling news, so fans were left in the dark when a wrestler left a company or was about to debut with a new one. And here was the competition's most prestigious title on WWF television. Now Hulk Hogan had his vitamins and his prayers and his cartoon show and his cereal that gave you diarrhea whenever you ate it, but Ric Flair had the respect of the fans. He had his bleach blonde hair, he had his rope, and the title on WWF TV. There is no overstating how huge of a moment this was and how we will never, ever see anything like this again. This brings us to Jerry Lawler's heart attack. The September 10th, 2012 edition of Raw was business as usual. An opening show segment with Bret Hart seemed to be the most noteworthy moment of the night until a primetime players versus a team hell no match. Suddenly, Jerry Lawler stopped talking. And then, Michael Cole did. It was eerily quiet. During the match, the fans started standing up and looking away from what was going on. In the background, various shots of Michael Cole looked on where Lawler was supposed to be, but he was off screen. 
Referee Charles Robinson also looked distracted, as did Titus O'Neil, and the fans started chanting for Jerry. We had no idea what was going on. Later, an emotional Cole informed us that the King had passed out and that CPR was being performed on him backstage at that very moment. For a while, millions of fans around the world watched together as we wondered whether the King was going to die or not. It was a scary situation as this beloved man had been in our living rooms, though not literally, for decades. Out of respect for his longtime partner, Cole said he would not announce for the rest of the night, which only made things even weirder. Luckily, by the time Raw was over, we found out that the King was going to be okay. We usually turn into wrestling for the drama, but watching the potential death of a longtime friend like The King made for a horrifying and unforgettable night of TV. I can't believe it. The streak ends. The Undertaker's WrestleMania winning streak was the most hallowed sacred streak in all of wrestling, no offense to Bo Dallas. Fans loved it and looked forward to every WrestleMania to see it defended, or someday lose it to a young up-and-comer, maybe like a Mojo Rawley type guy. At WrestleMania 30, Undertaker was set to face Brock Lesnar, and there was absolutely no way the former UFC champ was going to win this one. After all, Brock already did the J-O-B to John Cena in his first match back, and then another loss to his much older, less physically intimidating boss Triple H. So what would one more hurt? Well, actually Brock didn't lose at all. Somehow, he defeated Taker cleanly at WrestleMania. The streak was dead, like Katie Vick or Al Wilson dead. After all these years and all these great matches and opponents, it was over to an extreme part-time wrestler. The faces on the crowd said it all. No one could believe what they had just seen and conspiracy theories immediately popped up online saying that Taker was supposed to have kicked out but couldn't because he was knocked out. Somehow this was Vince McMahon's master plan all along. He willingly gave up one of his biggest money-making matches of the year, every year. You could argue all day whether it was the right call to have Brock beat Taker and it wasn't, but there's no way that anyone saw this coming and if they said they did, they're a liar. Finally, we come to Shane McMahon on Monday Nitro. For millions of fans, WCW was their favorite wrestling promotion. They were there for the great moments, like Ric Flair's title reigns, Goldberg's epic winning streak, and the New World Order. But they were also there through the lows, like Ric Flair in a mental asylum, Goldberg losing his streak to a cattle prod, and the NWO B team featuring Stevie Ray and Horace Hogan. Through it all though, we knew WCW would be around because billionaire Ted Turner owned the thing and he would keep it on air until the end of time. Well, it was foretold in the wrestling prophecy that Marcus Bagwell and Judy Bagwell would battle for the WCW Cruiserweight title inside of a dumpster in the apocalypse. Except for when Ted Turner no longer owned it. AOL Time Warner was a catastrophic business merger. It ousted billionaire Ted from control, and now WCW was at the mercy of people that didn't like or get wrestling. When the company lost tens of millions of dollars in a year, that was enough for them to cancel it from TBS and TNT. The long-standing rivalry between the WWF and WCW was over. To add insult to injury, Vince McMahon reportedly picked up the company for only a couple million dollars. Chump change to the man. Couldn't the Wolfpack have banded their money together to buy the thing? In March of 2001, WCW had their season finale, which was odd because they had never had one before. It was more of a series finale, like the one Cheers had, but less funny. The show was also simulcast on WWF Raw, and on that channel, Vince fired Jeff Jarrett in front of all of us and teased what he was going to do with his new toy. Before he could shut the doors on WCW for good, here came the money, and Shane McMahon of all people showed up on Monday Nitro. He pulled a fast one on his pops as he informed us that a McMahon did own the company, but it was Shane himself. McMahon versus McMahon on two different networks at the same time. All the history between the two companies, all the insults lobbed back and forth, all the talent raids, and it all came down to this. Father and son. Shocking, sad, surreal. Well, that's all for the list. Special thanks to Nick Dinsmore for helping out. I will be sure to get his donut shortly. Check out his promotion at MidwestAllPro.com and learn to become a wrestler yourself. Follow me on Twitter at Andrew Socek and sound off below for your most surreal WWE moments. Now, it's time to kick out. <laughs>